As I was getting ready to come up and, uh, and to share, um, the Lord brought something to memory that I thought, maybe I can share it with the church as it pertains to a new cycle uh, that we're, we've entered into t- to, to today. Um, years ago, we were on a, a trip to Israel, by the way, we are hoping to be able to go this year, and we will have uh, interest sign-ups and all of that to see if some might want to go. But anyway, we were in Israel, and we were on our way home. Maybe after this story, you're not going to want to go. I just thought of that. Um, <laughs> because when we, <laughs> when we came to the uh, eastern border of the United States, we were going to land in New York, and then we're going to um, transfer to another plane and fly to L.A., well, as we began to arrive, there was a huge storm. It was one of the most terrible storms that New York, New York had had in a long time. It was really bad. And we're in a 747. Those of you who've, who've uh, flown on planes that large, it's an enormous, enormous plane. And the plane was beginning to move, and it was beginning to, to kind of like just suddenly just drop and then come back up. And and people began to get very scared because it, 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 while it looked bad, the, um, there were Jews on the plane. It was El Al, so there were a lot of Jewish passengers. And this is how serious it got. We had Jewish people coming up to us saying, please come into the back and pray with us. Normally, they don't want to pray with Christians. But they said, you know, today we'll make an exception. You know, so they were bringing people and, and Christians were in the back praying. And it got kind of... Uh, kind of messy, and it was so bad that people began screaming, and then the uh, masks began to fall, you know, that you put on your face if uh, cabin pressure is lost, and I was reading the newspaper, and as I was reading the newspaper, I turned, and I could see my daughter, Corinne, and uh, she and her little girlfriend she was with began to sing praise songs to the Lord, so I knew she was scared, because she, <laughs> she never did that. And so, it was bad. It was bad. And, well, finally, obviously, we landed safely. And my daughter, Corinne, later was speaking to me. And she said this to me. I just was thinking of it. She said, Dad, why weren't you afraid? And I looked at her, because obviously I wasn't. She says, why weren't you afraid? I said, because I knew that God wasn't through with our church yet. I knew that. And then she looks at me with the wisdom of a 15-year-old, and she says, did it ever occur to you that he doesn't need you to finish his work? And I said, you know, I'm glad I didn't think about that when we were going up and down, right? Did it ever occur to you that God doesn't need you? And so today we inaugurated a new president, and people are bummed out, and some are happy, some are rejoicing, others are, are not. All I know is God is in control. God is in control. And, th- and that I know. That I know. And so my other daughter, Anna, who was uh, nine years old at the time, told me recently, she said, Dad, do you remember when the plane was doing what it did and all, and I said, yeah, baby, of course I do. She said, did you know I wasn't afraid? Now, this just came up. My daughter's 37 now. This just came up. She said, did you know that I, uh, I wasn't afraid either? And I said, no, honey. She says, do you know why I wasn't afraid? And I said, no, why weren't you afraid? Because I'm telling you, it was, it was a mess. She says, because I kept my eye on you. She said, because I knew if you panicked, then I have reason to panic. But you never panicked. You had peace. And the peace you had, I was able to borrow from. By watching you and the way you handled that, I was kept at peace. So my desire as a pastor here is to make people at peace. I'm not afraid. I'm not worried. Our God is in control. He's going to do what he wants to do. And we trust him. And that's just how it is. And I just thought, you know, I was thinking that, before, and I thought, well, I might as well share with them. Um, some of you are touched by that. Others have already turned me off because you're watching online. But anyway, 
Job chapter 17, verses 1 and 2, and we'll get into our study. Job chapter 17, verses 1 and 2. My spirit is broken. My days are extinguished. The grave is ready for me. Are not mockers with me? And does not my eye dwell on their provocation? So let me remind you of what we've been looking at up to this point. Job has been defending himself against his friends, his own friends, who had traveled a great distance to come and to bring comfort to him. Well, the moment they began to speak, they began to accuse him. And as they've been accusing of him of one thing after another, he is now in the place where he is beginning to defend himself against their accusations. You see, as we've seen coming up to this chapter, his friends are convinced that he's been reaping the results of some hidden sin. One friend, Aliphaz, had just told him that he had cast off the fear of God. We had seen that in Job chapter 15, verse 4. And he told Job that his speech was unprofitable. He said, you're speaking out of carnality. You're speaking out of pride. So in response to this, when Job began to speak in chapter 16, he called these men who had traveled to speak to him miserable comforters. You see, instead of comforting him, his friends were attacking him. And so they were miserable comforters because instead of comfort, they were bringing to him more pain, more misery. He told them that they weren't telling him anything that he didn't already know, but they were acting as if they were wise. He said, but in fact, you're shallow men. And he got frustrated. He was frustrated with them. He was tired of all the hot air that they were spouting. And he wanted them to stop speaking such useless words. He told them, you need to put yourself in my place for a moment. You need to think of what has happened in my life. Because Job had lost his children. Job had lost his possessions. Job had lost the admiration of his wife. Job had, respect, had, had lost the respect of the people. Job had lost his health. And he was suffering terribly, scraping at his skin with broken shards of pottery so that the, the, the pus and infection would ooze out. And there he is on an ash heap in total sorrow. And here they come, and there they're speaking to him. And they're not having any kind of pity on him at all. So he said to them, what have you lost that qualifies you to instruct me? You see, it's easy to offer advice when you're healthy. It's easy to offer advice when you're free of pain. It's, it's easy to offer advice when you have no concerns. And so he's saying if our situation was reversed, I could easily speak as you do to you. You see, it's easy to hurt those who are down. And it's easy to criticize those who are in pain and feeling affliction. But he says, that's something I wouldn't do to you. He had said in chapter 16, verse 5, he said, I would strengthen you with my mouth. And the comfort of my lips would relieve your grief. I wouldn't come and arrogantly blame you and tell you you're only reaping what you've sown. You've sinned against God. I would, I would bring you a word of encouragement. I would strengthen you. I would comfort you because I know that you're in sorrow. And so as this is all taking place, Job began to number his complaints as we saw recently. He began to speak of how God has treated him. He began to speak concerning the pain he's suffering. And he closed the chapter, he closed chapter 16, wishing that he had someone who could mediate for him, someone who could stand in the gap and present his case before God. And he didn't. And all he could do is to wait, to wait for his death that was about to come. And he says it. He says, I'm on my way to the place of no return. I'm on my way to the land of death. I just wish that you would speak well of me. I wish that you would understand that I'm innocent. You see, his reason for arguing with them was he wanted them to know without any doubt, I, I'm not being punished by God. I haven't done what you're accusing me of doing. And so as he's speaking, verse 1 here, 
in chapter 17, continuing, he said, my spirit's broken. My days are extinguished. The grave is ready for me. I'm ready to die. I, I've been mocked continually. No one is offering me any help. The result is I've been worn down. And to be honest with you, I'm ready to die. What's interesting, and I'll take a moment to look at this, when he says, my spirit is broken. I was using commentators, and, and many of the commentators I use um, put out their comment, uh, comments on Scripture in the 1700s or 1800s. Uh, it's been said, if they're not dead, they're not read. And so I look at the older commentators because they haven't tried to update the comments to some modern theology, and so I use the older ones. And so one of them, actually more than one, was pointing out the phrase, my spirit is broken. Literally what he's saying, and I believe the King James uh, says this, literally what he's saying is, my breath is corrupt. My breath is corrupt. And um, it means just what it says. My breath smells terribly. He didn't have any mouthwash, apparently. So he says, my breath is corrupt. What is he saying? He said, the disease that I have, which commentators believe that he had a form of elephantiasis. The disease that I have has caused my breath to be offensive to any who are around me. And the smell that he's speaking of is really a picture of the stench of death. And so he's saying that it's obvious that I'm going through pain and even my breath is offensive. And, and some have said in light of that and the way that he was speaking that, that this may be a picture of the distress that he's suffering. So he could be saying, I, I'm suffering so greatly I can hardly breathe. My lamp, the lamp of my life, is about to go out. When he says that, my days are extinguished. It's another way of saying my lamp is about to go out and the grave is ready for me. Verse 2, are not mockers with me? And does not my eye dwell on their provocation? My friends are mockers. Instead of bringing comfort, my friends are bringing more pain. You're accusing me, he's saying, of being a hypocrite. And you're saying that I'm using my religion to actually hide my evil. You're saying I'm a religious hypocrite. Because again, remember, he's been arguing that he hasn't sinned. He's been arguing that he doesn't know why he's going through. I haven't done anything to, to reap the consequences and all. But they have already said, no, you, you've only had the appearance of righteousness when in reality God sees your heart, Job, and, and that's why you are being punished. So he says to them, uh, I, I'm not a hypocrite. I, I haven't hidden my evil by a religious kind of uh, of appearance. And that's the kind of thing that, that is offensive. This religious hypocrisy is something that's offensive not only in the Old Testament, but of, of course, obviously, it's offensive in the New. Remember in Matthew 23 and verses 5 through 7 how that Jesus was condemning the religious leaders, the Pharisees, and he said, everything they do is done for men to see. They make their phylacteries wide, the tassels of their garments long, they love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greatest, or rather greeted in the marketplaces and to have men call them rabbi. So he was speaking of the religious hypocrisy of his day. Well, these people are accusing Job of, of having religious hypocrisy. And so he's saying this is, a, this is unfair. He, he also speaks about, when he says, are not mockers with me, he also says, does not my eye dwell on their provocation? That's interesting. It's another way of saying their accusations are not only with me during the day, but I can't get them out of my mind at night. At night, I dwell on these things. I think of the things that you're saying, and, and I think of this constantly. I dwell in it constantly. I can't get these things out of my mind. So he's saying, this is, this is how you've affected me. I can't even have a moment's of peace, moment of peace because during the day, I, I hear it, and during the night, it seems to be repeating in my mind. In verse 3, he says, put down a pledge for me with yourself. 
Now notice when he says, now put down a pledge for me with yourself. The yourself that he's speaking of is he's asking God to do that. Who is he who will shake hands with me? God, give me an assurance that you're on my side. God, help me to know that you're actually listening to me. Have you ever done that? Have you ever prayed like that? Lord, I, I read your word and I do the things that you tell me to do to the best of my ability. But sometimes I simply need to have a sense of your presence. Lord, can you reassure me that you're with me right now? And so, God, give me an assurance. Show me that you support me. God, remind me of your promises. And, and Lord, please be there for me. When he says, who is he who will shake hands with me? We need to remember what obviously shaking hands uh, means. It, it, it's one of the ways during his day that a contract or an agreement would be ratified. He's saying, my friends are accusing me of sin. None of them will stand up for me. None of them will guarantee me. So, Lord, I'm asking you to be the one who supports me. So put down a pledge for me with yourself. In verse 4, for you have hidden their heart from understanding. Therefore, you will not exalt them. I want to talk to you about this for just a moment. What he's saying here. You have hidden their heart from understanding. That's an interesting phrase. God, and he's speaking to the Lord, God, you have kept them from seeing what is obvious. You're the one who's withholding them from seeing this. You have kept them from understanding what is taking place. So what is this? He's saying this, what is occurring is spiritual. And God, you have withheld their eyes from seeing what is really taking place here. God, you have kept them from seeing. Why is that? Well, when you look at this in the old as well as the new, one of the things you discover is that spiritual truth is revealed by God. Spiritual truth is revealed. I have the scripture I, I've quoted many times over the years. It's one of my favorite ones that pertains to this. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. The natural, the word natural man in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 2.14, the word natural, the natural man, the word natural is the unspiritual man. It speaks of the one who's devoid of the power of the Holy Spirit or the presence of God in their life. He's the natural man or the natural woman, the woman who is not saved. The natural man receives not. The word receive means to welcome. So the unspiritual person will not welcome. It's a picture of someone standing at a door knocking at a friend's house, but the friend won't open the door to him. They're not receiving. They're not welcoming. The natural man, the unspiritual man, receives not or does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. And then he tells you why. Because spiritual things are, are revealed by God. So the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish to, foolishness to them. The word foolish is where we get the word moronic or imbecilic. They make no sense. So the natural man thinks that the things of the Spirit of God are stupid. It makes no sense. They are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them. It's not possible for him to know them, for they are spiritually discerned. God reveals it. So how do you know spiritual truth? By going to a Bible study? Alone? No. By God revealing this to you. God's Holy Spirit, because you're a believer in Christ, God's Holy Spirit takes and he knits within you. It's like deep calling unto deep. And so you hear a study or you're reading the word, and the Holy Spirit knits that within you, and there's something within you that recognizes it and says, that's the answer. That's what I've been looking for. Yes, Jesus, now I get it. But God's truth, and this is so basic, but it's really important, God's truth must be revealed because if God chooses to hide himself, who can find him? You know, sometimes we say, well, I found the Lord. <laughs> no, if, if God were hiding himself, I mean, come on, I play hide and seek with my kids, and, and 
I could, I could find them. But God isn't playing hide and seek. If God decided to hide somewhere, you would never find him. He has to reveal himself to you. And so spiritual truth is revealed. And when Job is speaking concerning these things, the fact is God has withheld your eyes from seeing this is a very spiritual thing. He's saying you do not see this because God has not revealed this to you. You don't see this because for whatever reason God has, he has, he has hidden this truth from you. God has withheld you from seeing. Truth is something that's revealed. And God can keep people from seeing. In John 12, verse 40, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn, and I would heal them. There is a spiritual blindness, and Job is saying that God has kept them from seeing what is taking place. God has withheld your understanding. And that's why you're saying these things. Now, when you understand that, it helps you when people begin to hurt and criticize you. It helps you when people begin to say things that they really don't understand or really don't know. And so Job is simply saying, God has kept you from seeing this. You know, I learned a long time ago that you might be able to argue well and may be able to present a scripture well and you may be able to defend a position well. And you may get in a debate with somebody and, and know enough information to win an argument. I learned that when I was uh, 23 years old. I learned that. It doesn't seem like 10 years ago, but it was. I learned that when I was 23 years old. I learned that because I was a person who, once I got saved, I, got, I started getting hungry for God's word. And then I started defending truth because I didn't realize that this is what the Lord was preparing me for. I simply felt that if it's true, you need to know it's true and you need to live as if it's true and you need to believe that it's true and your life ought to be changed because it's true. And I learned that at the age of 23. And then people began to knock on my door to give me false doctrine. And uh, in, in my case, the most often uh, occurrences that, of that was when Jehovah's Witnesses would come and speak to me about the things that they most surely believed. And I can still remember because, and I've shared this before, I can remember that somebody had begun to share with me certain things, and I was a young believer. I'd just gotten out of the military, and so they spoke to me, and I remember saying to this woman and her friend, you know, I, I just don't think what you're saying is correct. I, I think you're wrong. Again, I'm just a new believer. I, what do I know? But I knew it was wrong. And they said, oh, no, God's word says this, and this is what the word says. This is what the word. And they kept on saying that to me. And it provoked me because I knew they were misquoting. I just didn't know how to, to show that. So I said, you know what? Let's talk again. Would you come over next week? And, and they said, oh, yes. And, and I, I, I don't know if it matters to you, but it's part of the story. They asked me, what's your last name? And uh, they, were, they were two white ladies. What is your last name? And I gave them my last name. Well, what kind of name is that? I said, I'm, I'm Mexican. Oh, okay. So the next week they came, and this white lady brought a Mexican because I kind of figured she, she must have thought, oh, a brown person. You must be speaking truth. I don't know. It was kind of odd. But anyway... During the week, I went to a bookstore, and it was a time when there weren't a lot of Christian bookstores, by the way. I had to travel from Whittier, where I was living. I had to travel into Orange County, and there was a bookstore, and I, that's when I bought Walter Martin's Kingdom of the Cults. And I came home, it has about 100 pages on Jehovah's Witnesses and their theology. And I read those pages and memorized quite a number of things, and was prepared. So when they came and sat down in my house, I began to ask them questions. I said, last time you were here, you told me that Jesus is Michael the archangel. And they said, yes, he's Michael the archangel, because his name means who is like God. <laughs> and I said, where does the Bible say that? Well, we've learned through systemite, no, 
where does the Bible say that? Well, it doesn't. Okay, then, what you say you believe really isn't in Scripture. You believe that Jesus is ruling the United States out of Brooklyn, New York. Can you show me somewhere in Scripture? So I learned these things, and I actually in, enjoyed talking to them and watching them squirm. And I said, last time you were here, you kept on saying, well, that's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. That's what you kept saying. But show me where the Bible says he came back. Show me. And I started doing that because I had memorized an argument from a, from a scholar. And, and then I learned, you know what? You can win arguments. So I started hunting Jehovah's Witnesses. I, I, would, I would, this is the truth, and I don't mean to sound mean. I was young, I was zealous, and, and I would pull over on purpose when I saw them knocking on doors so that they could come to me in my Volkswagen and I could tell them some things. And the Holy Spirit, let me get to the, the spiritual part of this. The Holy Spirit said to me, you're arrogant and you're not representing me right. You're argumentative and it doesn't bring honor to me. And he taught me this. And maybe somebody needs to hear it. Maybe not in this room. Maybe somebody online. He said, you can win an argument. I'll never forget that. You can win an argument, but you can still lose a soul. You're not loving them. You're not loving them. You're loving arguing. That was the truth. That was the truth. I had that attitude. And there are Christians, I tell you, who know truth but present it like it's a bazooka. They blow people up. People end up smoking like Wiley Coyote. Some of you might remember him. He won the argument. He lost his soul. And so the Lord said, and his word teaches this. It wasn't like just a conversation. His word teaches this, but I had that sense also. Give them the word. Always give them the word because it is the truth that sets people free. Not the way you can argue, but the scripture itself that when embraced will change someone's life. But God has to reveal that. The natural man receives not the things of the spirit of God. They are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. And so Job is saying God has without withheld your eyes. You don't see what is taking place because you have been blinded. God has kept you from seeing. Now, in verse 5, it says, He who speaks flattery to his friends, even the eyes of his children will fail. Now, he's actually speaking in, in prayer, really. He's speaking to God as he's saying this. It, it seems that he's saying that his friends are, are promising him, him blessings if he repents. Um, but um, he, he, he makes a statement, and, and I find it interesting uh, when it says, he who speaks flattery to his friends, even the eyes of his children will fail. It, it seems to be making uh, a statement that those who, who make these promises, flattering promises and all, they're saying if you, if you change, you're going to be blessed by God. Well, he's actually saying those kinds of untruths are harmful even to your kids. Why? Because he's saying that when you're teaching your children the things that you're arguing with me about, and he's speaking to the Lord in prayer about this, it's all tied up in that. He's saying uh, the children are taught to believe the wrong things, and the children are being taught to look for the wrong things. And so the arguments, and Lord, help them to see this. This is the kind of thing that's happening is actually taking them away from knowing truth and not helping them to know it. He says in verse 6, He who has made me a byword, but he has made me a byword of the people. Listen to that. And I have become one in whose face men spit. Now, you need to know and remember that Job had at one time been the, the, most, the most respected man. People everywhere knew of him. And they would give him great respect when he spoke. He was the guy that, that if there were a group of men, and they would be elders, men who were of, of, of good reputation. And when Job would walk in the room, it's, kinda, it's difficult to, to say this clearly, but when Job would walk in the room, they would get quiet. Here comes Job. 
And the men who were speaking amongst themselves and speaking in deep ways and all, and then you hear the, the sound off to the side and people are greeting and they hear Job and they look. And when Job would walk in, everybody got quiet. Everybody would be quiet because of the respect they had for this man. When Pastor Chuck was still alive, we would go um, yearly to have uh, planning meetings with uh, some of the men who were uh, overseers in Calvary Chapel. And we would have planning meetings. And, and the guys, we'd all be around the table, and there'd be quite a number of us. And we were seated in this room. There could be 20 or more men. And we're talking to our friends and visiting, catching up. And, and there's a lot of that, that noise. And the minute Pastor Chuck walked in, the minute he walked in, everybody got quiet. Not because God walked in the room, but because of our respect for our pastor. And these are men who were pastors over the movement of Calvary Chapel, some with multiple thousands in their churches, and yet the minute Chuck would walk in, and I can still remember it, we'd be seated there, we'd be talking, and here he comes, and it gets quiet. And Chuck would walk across and come and sit down, and then the very first thing he would be asked is, Pastor, what are you concerned with? That would be the very first question every meeting. And he said, have we, this was his answer, have we therefore be, begun in the spirit and will we be made perfect by the flesh? That was his number one answer. Is the Calvary Chapel movement going to continue walking in the spirit or are we going to go to man-made ways to grow churches? That was his number one concern. He would say it every time. Have we begun in the spirit? Will we be made perfect by the flesh? So I understand the way that when a man like Chuck would walk in the room, I respected him. He was my pastor. I loved him, and I asked him for wisdom, and he would give me his wisdom. There's a relation. Job was like that. So people who were great would be talking. Job would walk in the room, and they would be quiet because this man, Job, was here. He was highly respected. People everywhere gave him respect. Everywhere they would listen to his counsel, he said in Job 29, 7 and 8, when I went out to the gate by the city, when I took my seat in the open square, the young men saw me and hid, and the aged arose and stood. Though once greatly respected, he's now an object of gossip and derision. Even the lowest of men openly showed him great disrespect. In Job 30, verses 9 and 10, he says, now I am their taunting song. Yes, I'm their byword. They abhor me. They keep far from me. And they do not hesitate to spit in my face. He says in verse 7, My eye has also grown dim because of sorrow, and all my members are like shadows. I, I'm, I'm constantly in pain. I cry my heart out constantly. I'm worn out from weeping. I'm thin. My color has left me. I look like a ghost. I look like a shadow in verse 8. Upright men are astonished at this, and the innocent stirs himself up against the hypocrite. They consider, as they consider everything, the righteous are stirred to resist and to reject hypocrisy. Yet, verse 9, the righteous will hold to his way, and he who has clean hands will be stronger and stronger. The righteous will retain his integrity, will grow stronger through the whole trial. That's because trials such as these result in greater strength. And as Job is speaking about that, he's giving us insight into trials. I'm going to give you some things. Some of you may want to mark some of these things down because Job is giving us insight into trials. And, and I want to share some things with you uh, about trials. First thing about trials is they come upon everybody who lives for Jesus Christ everybody who's living for Jesus Christ. If you're not going through a trial, check out your life. You may, you may not be living right right now. You know, because the enemy has a way of just promoting you. But when I go through, when I'm not living the way the Lord would have me to live, I will go through trials. And that's, that, that happens to everybody. It's not unusual. Psalm 66 verse 10 says, For you, O God, have proved us. You have tried us as silver is tried. In 1 Peter 4, verses 12 and 3, the apostle said, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. Rejoice, inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, 
that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Don't be kicking against it, but allow God to work in you through the trial. It happens to everybody. It's not unusual. It, it's not that God hates you. It's God is refining you. A second thing is trials reveal the reality, quality, and the value of your faith because trials refine. Uh, Charles Spurgeon once said that trials teach us what we are. They dig up the soil and let us see what we are made of. So we desire to, uh, God to entrust to us great things. And so trials will reveal our faith in the small things. In 1 Peter 1, 7, it says that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And so he refines us. Third, trials reveal what's inside of us, and they reveal our weaknesses as well as our need. Because as we go through and endure trials, we are refined and we are strengthened. In James 1, 2 through 4, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. But let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. The psalmist in Psalm 27, 14 said it like this. He said, wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Fourth, a trial makes me look at my own heart. So I take spiritual inventory because guess what? God may be disciplining me through a trial, and I need to be aware of that. That's why in Psalm 139, 23, and 24, the psalmist said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, my anxieties, and see if there's any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. It makes me look at my own heart and begin to say, God, is there something that you're dealing with? A fifth thing is trials produce spiritual strength. They do so by making me dependent on God and not myself and someone else. In Romans 5, 3 through 5, not only so, we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope makes not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. So we depend on the Lord. A sixth thing, trials are used by God to prepare us for what he will have us to do. In Hebrews 10, 35 and 36, he says, do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. A seventh thing, trials direct our attention to God because we seek him for answers. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. An eighth thing, God uses trials to demonstrate his ability to bring us through. In 2 Peter 2, verse 9, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations, trials, and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. Rather than complaining, look for what God is doing. Rather than complaining, how come in that way that we can We begin to say, God, what are you doing? What is, is there something within me that you want to cleanse? Is there some area of my life that you're not pleased with? And then, God, I need your help, and I need your strength, and Lord, I'm just... And the Lord begins to show you that there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. God is able with the temptation also to, also to make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. There's nothing that you're going through that God hasn't made a, a way of escape for you. He has. When it says God has made a way of escape, it's a picture of you in a battle and soldiers are against you and there's no place to turn. And when it says, but God has made a way of escape, it's like he has cut out of a rock, a cave and a passageway. So when your back is against the rock, God is opening up a way of escape, and he'll take care of you. And the problem sometimes we have is we think that the things we're going through are unique to only us, when in fact, 
They're common to all of us. And so instead of running, he says, hold your ground. Wait, and you will see the deliverance of the Lord. So you're standing at the edge of a river, or you're standing at the edge of a sea, and the enemy's behind you, and your way is cut off. And God, like he did with Moses, sends a strong wind, separates the water, dries the ground, sets you through, and then takes care of the enemy that comes after you. That's how it works. You hold fast. I don't know. Maybe somebody needs to hear this. Maybe somebody's in the midst of a trial right now. Hold fast. Don't let go. God will see you through. You'll make it through. You're going to turn around, and you're going to see that God was with you every step of the way. And the times that you were crying out saying, what's going on? The Lord is saying, I was always there. I was always next to you. But you were so caught up in you and what you were going through, you didn't even notice that I was protecting you. And when you finally said, I can't take this anymore, that made it possible for me to actually work what I wanted to do. Listen, after many years of walking with the Lord, I'm, I'm only telling you what he's taught me. It's true. When I give up quickly, God shows up quickly. If I want to keep on complaining and fight and worry, he'll let me. He'll let me until eventually I have to just give up. This guy was walking by a lake, and a woman was standing at the lip of the lake, and out several feet out from the lip of the lake, he could see flailing. So he stood next to the woman, and he said to the woman, what's wrong? And she says, my son can't swim. He fell in. I can't swim. I can't save him. He's drowning. Can you help him? And the man says, yes, and still stands there. He's standing there, and she's panicking, and he doesn't jump in. And he's just standing there. She's, what are you doing? What are you doing? He just stands with his arms folded. Finally, the kid goes under the water the last time and doesn't come up for a few seconds. The man jumps in and grabs him, drags him, puts him out on ground, and the boy revives. And so the woman says to him, why didn't you jump in and save him? Why did you let him get to that point? And he said, because as long as he had strength, if I'd have gone in, he'd have drowned me along with himself. I had to wait till he had no strength so I could save him. And I've learned that lesson spiritually. As long as I'm constantly flaying around saying, I can take care of it, I can do it, the Lord kind of like just waits until I know that I can't anymore. And that's when I whimper and say, God, help me. And that's when he delivers me. So it's really wise to give up quickly. It'd be like if I was going into the ring with Tyson. I'd give up. <laughs> just makes sense. I get beat up. So just give up. And the way the Lord works in us, he does, he does his thing in us and changes us. Moving on, it says in verse 10, please come back again, all of you. For I shall not find one my wise man among you. Please come back. I won't find one wise man. What is that? That's called sarcasm. He's saying, come back and argue with me again. None of you is wise enough to handle the argument, but I'm willing to listen to you ramble on. In verse 11, my days are past. My purposes are broken off, even the thoughts of my heart. In other words, when he says my days are past, I'm dying. And my plans for my life have all been destroyed. My hopes and my dreams have been extinguished. I have been left without hope. Verse 12, they change the night into day. The light is near, they say, in the face of darkness. You miserable counselors are trying to change the reality of what I'm experiencing. You're telling me that night is day and that darkness is light. What you're saying to me is cheer up. Everything's getting better. But in fact, it isn't. In verse 13, he goes on, If I wait for the grave as my house, if I make my bed in the darkness, if I say to corruption, you're my father, and to the worm, you're my mother and my sister, where then is my hope? As for my hope, who can see it? Will they go down to the gates of Sheol? Shall we have rest together in the dust? 
as far as I can see, the only thing that I have waiting for me is a grave. And the only thing that is waiting is the darkness of a tomb. In, in chapter 8, verses 20 and 21, Bildad had told him, Behold, God will not cast away the blameless, nor will he uphold the evildoers. He will yet fill your mouth with laughing, your lips with rejoicing. We <laughs> say, I don't see this. What I see, instead of laughing and joy, is a grave. I see darkness. And the only hope I have is to die, to embrace it. It'll end my physical suffering. When he says in verse 14, if I say to corruption, you're my father, and to the worm, you're my mother, I, I, I look at the grave and I see it as my closest relatives, if you will. They're, they're waiting to embrace me and bring me to peace. In other words, the only hope I have is to die. Now, you've told me that if I repent, I'd be restored and would once again be blessed. Because in chapter 11, verses 16 and 17, Zophar had said, you'll forget your misery and remember it as waters that have passed away and your life would be brighter than noonday. Well, he said, I would disagree with you. The only hope I have is dying and ending my misery. Where is my hope? Verse 15, as for my hope, who can see it? What hope in life do I have? And what hope do you offer me? As for any hope offered to me, it'll never come to pass. It's never going to happen. Verse 16, will they go down to the gates of Sheol? Shall we have rest together in the dust? Now, when he says to Sheol, Sheol is, 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 is pictured as an underground prison. It has bars. It has bolts. It holds the doors closed. The, the word Sheol is, is, is the same as the word in the New Testament, Hades. Hades and Sheol are what would be called the holding cell of the dead. It seems that Job is saying that when I die, my hopes will be buried and die with me. My body, my hopes, everything shall be together in death. It's the only place I'll ever rest. But he speaks of this place as Sheol. Now, gates have keys that allow entrance as well as exit, which is interesting because he's speaking of Sheol. He's speaking of a place like as a cell. And it's interesting in Matthew that Jesus gave Peter and the rest of the apostles what he called the keys of the kingdom. In Matthew 16, 19, he told Peter, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And so he said, these are the keys, your authority to, pre to give a message and to declare someone to be forgiven because that opens up the cell, if you will. It enables them to go into heaven. And the gates of Sheol would have locks, but Jesus has the key to the lock. In Revelation 1.18, we saw how he said, I'm the living one. I was dead. Now, look, I'm alive forever and ever. I hold the keys of death and Hades. Every time you preach the gospel and share with somebody of the good things of God, that person, when they receive Christ, are actually, you're using the keys and you're unlocking the door that's allowing them freedom. That's one of the reasons why when you see somebody get saved, the joy just comes up in your heart because this person has been set free. I still remember that when the Lord spoke to my heart and I got saved. I still remember. I'll always remember the joy of salvation. Do you remember when you got saved? I remember. I've never forgotten all these years that, that, that sense that my, my burden of sin was gone. I, I've been forgiven. And, and there was a joy that came that I didn't have before. That came because I had been a prisoner, but the gospel key had opened the door and the gate sprung open and I was set free. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. Sheol has pictures, is pictured with, with bars. And Job is speaking concerning that. But he's saying, I'm a prisoner. I haven't been set free. But the hope that he desires, that knowledge that he's been set free, is one day revealed most clearly through the gospel because the hope is Jesus. Because Jesus is the one who holds the keys. Jesus gave the keys to his followers. And we of all people have hope. And we of all people can rest because of Jesus. Again, My hope is in the Lord. 
It's never been in man since I got saved. Man does let us down. I let people down. Men let people down. But God never lets you down. God never lets you down. He's the one person that you can, one person that you can always trust because he never leaves you. He never forsakes you. He never fails. He's always there. He walks with you. You're never alone. And so I have hope. And I may not always be happy, but I certainly always have hope because my hope is in the Lord. And he is where my confidence has been entrusted. He's what he, he is the one we all as believers should surely hope in because he never fails. He never fails. And the way that my little girl, Anna, was looking at me when all the plane was, was, was shaking and, and people were screaming and crying and, and she said, Dad, I just kept my eye on you because I knew that if you were afraid, I'd be afraid. And Dad, you didn't get afraid, so I didn't get afraid. Well, I keep my eyes on the Lord because he's never afraid. Try and find a Bible scripture where it says, and Jesus saw the devil and, and cried in fear. It's not there. But the Bible says the devils fear and tremble at Jesus Christ. So we're on his side better than that. He is for us. And so we don't worry. It's just that way. God is in control.